Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Hack UCF Friday meeting. My name is Michael Teresi, um, current president of Hack UCF. So uh, let's get started with today's meeting. Um, you probably know the drill by now. If you don't, um, we do have a sign-in form. So take the time to please sign in, track your attendance. Helps out with, obviously, taking attendance and certain qualifications for running as an officer. That's happening uh, actually later today. So that form will be open. It's dropped in chat. So if you want to be an active student member, the only benefit is voting and running, um, then please do that. We do have a few ways to keep in contact with us. Um, our most popular and preferred method is going to be joining our Discord. Uh, you can do that by scanning the fancy QR code you see on screen. Uh, also by visiting hackucf.org slash Discord. That is where we hang out. That is where we send most of our announcements, actually all of our announcements. And you can touch base with some of our members um, and get some questions answered uh, about the club or industry, uh, home labbing technology, stuff like that. Um, we do have a mailing list, which you are encouraged to sign up for. We do send you one email uh, every week uh, detailing the contents of the workshop that may or may not be happening and the general body meeting that happens every Friday. Additionally, we do push out other information on there, such as any good competitions, tryouts, um, special events happening that week. Um, we don't sell your information. We just send you emails once a week, um, completely optional. Uh, we do have a shop you can buy some of your uh, Hack UCF merchandise from. Uh, we have t-shirts, masks, uh, hoodies, not the hoodie, but some generic hoodies, uh, unfortunately not the fancy one, um, mugs, stuff like that. You can check it out, find something interesting for you. Um, and of course, we do have a Twitter. Um, we post cyber things, retweet, all the tweet stuff. I don't manage it, so what's the internet? Am I right? Today's topics, um, we're going to, go, going to go over some announcements today. Um, and then a very special meeting today. We're actually going to be opening up announcements. And don't worry, information about that later. Uh, current events today is going to be brought to us uh, by Kill uh, in the Discord. And the main talk today is going to be led by myself. It's going to be on systems automation, uh, mostly focusing on Ansible, touching a bit on Docker, um, and then follow up with a live demo. Please feel free to ask questions during that time. And then after that, we're going to go with our closing. So um, first things first, operations. Uh, who are they? A uh, group of dedicated individuals who volunteer their time to help run the club. Um, these are not officers, so there's no elections for these. Um, this is an extension to them to help us plan things such as these general body meetings, any workshops, and other club activities. If you're interested in pitching in and helping around, um, you're welcome to attend the operations meetings that happen every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Uh, the link for that is posted in the Discord um, every Tuesday. The announcements today are going to be about our t-shirts, um, some CTFs that we have, um, Cyber Challenge and NCO, probably the last week we'll mention these. So if it's not closed already, it'll be closed very soon. So be sure to check those out. Um, and then of course, CPTC tryouts are happening right now. So um, for the t-shirts, we do have new merchandise. Uh, by this point, it's probably not new. Um, it has been around a while, but in case you've not been um, keeping up, we do have uh, t-shirts on our store. These are the featured t-shirts in that section on the online store um, that were designed last semester and published at the beginning of this semester. Um, the winning design was the virtual campus that you see in the center. Um, and the two others were also submitted alongside that. Um, but because we're online and it is no cost to us, we've decided to publish all three designs online. If you are a dues paying member, that is you visited our PayPal and um, paid your $10 donate uh, dues, then you do get a $10 discount on these shirts. So it seems like a pretty good deal. Um, you don't have to be a dues paying, dues paying member to receive these shirts. And you can, of course, buy multiple shirts. Um, the only caveat there was a $10 discount on one of these shirts if you pay dues. Um, yeah. If you've not received an email for that, please reach out. Um, but I think we got most of them thus far. So on the CTF department, if you're ever looking to do any CTF competitions or want to do CTFs in your free time, but don't necessarily want to compete in any of them or register for CTFs for some reason, um, you're more than welcome to visit our own CTF website, ctf.hackcf.org, which is hosted by us and has some of our challenges on there. It is open 24 seven um, and open there for you to train and 
Um, have some fun with that. Um, if you want to find out more competitions beyond the ones that we post here, uh, please visit ctftime.org for that. So um, US Cyber Challenge, it's going to be the 12th annual CyberQuests. The competition link is available on screen at cyberquests.org. Registration costs zero dollars. That is a grand total of free. Um, competitors are invited to the exclusive cyber boot camp and compete in the final CDF. The, it ends March 14th, which is uh, the past. So disregard. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, the National Cyber League Spring Edition, live registration is open. Is this one still open? Let's see. Ye perhaps. If you're interested in Cost 35, please look at the link there. Um, we'll have you updated by next week. Don't worry. There is late fees, yes. Um, do we know what those are by chance? No, $45, we think. Okay. So, a um, bit much, but if you're interested in doing NCL, then it may be worth it. Individual game happening in like a few days until the March 28th, and the team game is April 9th to 11th. Um, as with all the CTFs, um, if you're interested in doing um, competition teams, stuff like that, um, it is probably preferred. You also get some experience with competitions beforehand, um, such as with NCL, Cyber Challenges, and other CTFs and stuff like that. Speaking of those competition teams, uh, CPTC tryouts are now open. Um, if you're interested in being a lead hacker for UCF um, and having all the fun with that, you're encouraged to submit a write-up for one easy and one medium hack the box write-ups. Those must be active machines. Um, so they cannot be retired is what that means because once a machine is retired, um, then the write-ups are publicly available and that kind of makes it easy for you to find answers for them. And it's not much of a challenge at that point. Um, while some write-ups are publicly available for the machines already, because some people just like breaking the rules, um, it's encouraged you probably don't look at that because you're only going to hurt yourself. Um, it's an opportunity to grow your skills. So kind of taking someone else's write-up defeats that purpose. Uh, the actual competitive team will be a group of eight people who compete in the competition, competitive hacking competitions in the fall semester. Uh, practice for CPTC will happen a bit into summer up until the fall semester. Um, while it is going to be a group of eight people, um, there may be an opportunity to shadow alongside that. I'm not sure the specifics on that, but do not let that number uh, scare you or discourage you from applying. Um, if it's something you're interested in, please fill out the form um, at the bottom of the screen at the bit.ly link and submit write-ups when you have the time. Um, we don't want to be discouraged by any number. Uh, we'll just kind of see, please apply and then we'll go from there. If you're interested in sending submissions, uh, the close date for that is going to be April 18th at 11.59 p.m. Um, to submit those write-ups, please submit um, them to acoti at hackyshef.org. The email is on screen. If you have any uh, additional questions on that, uh, please feel free to send an email to him or drop by our CPTC channel in our Discord um, where we have some of the other members of CPTC past and present who have competed and we'll be there to give some context into the competitions. Uh, that is correct. There is also a social engineering challenge that uh, was just announced. So if you're interested in CPTC, the social engineering challenge is also Red Team Offensive Security. That will be some um, nice uh, background to have going into these um, competition teams. So um, not like I would know or anything. However, if you were to apply to CPTC and say that you have done the social engineering challenges and other challenges such as like that, it may or may not be helpful to you. Take that for what it's worth. So um, with all of that, we're going to go, go into the fun stuff. Uh, this is a wall of text. Do not worry, I will not read it all to you. What we're going to do now is cover the four officer positions here at Hack UCF, uh, talk a bit about them and kind of inform you of how to apply for those. Um, so first up is the president, which is myself. Um, a few things here that we do, um, mostly what I've been doing recently is kind of just meeting, uh, meeting with some more people, uh, writing like a document or two here and there. Um, basically, yes, become Troisi uh, as stated in chat. Um, if you can do that, you'll be doing great. Um, but you don't have to be exactly like me and probably be your own. So um, as president, um, basically, I have to keep up with all of the club's happenings um, just from a, a 
you know, management perspective, make sure everything's kind of going uh, along. Uh, TLDR, make sure the club doesn't completely explode and like everything falls away, you know? Um, I make a lot of contacts with the like, UCF, meetings with them month to month, week to week, keeping up to date with uh, the advisor on club happenings, all that fun stuff. Um, occasionally, oh, of course, we lead them, I lead the meetings. Uh, almost forgot that one. It's almost like I'm doing that right now. Uh, Friday meetings, uh, lead those, ops meetings, lead those. Um, yeah. All right. You can, of course, read all this on screen. Um, you sign financial documents, so that's fun um, if you like signing things. Uh, be familiar with a bunch of rules and regulations, but don't worry, it's not like too much. It's just like documents. All right. So next is the vice president. Uh, basically assist the vice uh, president in their duties. Um, they also coordinate conferences. So what that means in our context, um, the vice president has mostly been helping out, organize some events, reaching out to point of contacts um, and stuff like that, helping these meetings get planned uh, throughout. I'm not sure if Ryan is in the chat, but if he can, I don't know if I see him, he can just say something in the chat about the role, that'd be cool. If not, that's also right. I know he works very busy guy. And of course, every role is going to have the provide all documents and records to the next person. That's kind of a, a given. All right. Next up is the treasurer. Um, as, in, uh, as you probably know what a treasurer does, uh, they handle money and financial documents and all that fun paperwork. Um, so one of the main things they do is present a budget of reports and deposits, um, all that fun stuff to basically OSI upon request or myself or the vice president, um, manage PayPal's, check dues, um, so when you pay dues, uh, if something doesn't happen, you know, you know to complain. Don't actually complain, that's a joke. Please don't do that. <laughs> um, obligatory financial records, a lot of financial stuff. Um, Addison, wanna mention something else about that? That's not just all paperwork. Anything fun happen? Guess not, nothing fun over there. All right, up next is the secretary. Um, that's currently Jeffrey's position. Uh, he's the guy that sends you the news newsletters. Uh, so the mailing list goes to him. Once a week, he sends those out uh, 48 hours in advance. So it gets out, sent out basically Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, he keeps accurate minutes, which is very nice and very helpful um, for those that like to need to remember things. We don't remember absolutely everything. So that's just during the operations meetings, um, keeps track of notes and all that stuff. Uh, members, contact information, update form. Reading this, I see there's a lot of paperwork uh, more than I expected for all these roles, but don't worry, there's not that much paperwork from day to day. It's just kind of the beginning and the end once you set things up. Eligibility for officers, constitution, all that stuff. This is basically all they copy paste from the constitution. So don't worry, you don't have to memorize this and commit it to memory. Um, you'll be able to visit this later. And there's going to be a summary um, on the next slide. Does Jeff, you want to add anything to this? Sure. So just to kind of summarize what the secretary does, um, Michael got it right on the nail. I'm the one who spams your inboxes and social media feeds and um, deals with some note taking and paperwork behind the scenes. But most of my day to day consists of minutes on ops meetings and any other um, miscellaneous meetings, as well as making sure you guys know that, hey, we're having a club meeting on Friday and or Saturday. So that's my main role as secretary. So if, if you wanna be the guy in charge of social media, making notes and feel like you're organized, then this might be the role for you. All right, thank you. Hope that's interesting to some people here. So um, with all that there, don't worry. Um, this will be brought up later. However, if you see all of that and you'd like to run, here's how you do that. Um, the nominations are being accepted starting right now. So um, you don't have to like say it, but in chat or drop in chat, we'll get to that on how to do that. Um, so right now until April 6th, um, April 6th at around 9 p.m. That's going to be our ops meeting of that week. So by the time our operations meeting closes for that week, we will take anyone left in the queue, send it off to our club advisor and basically check student enrollment um, to make sure all that's eligible. The election day is going to be April 9th during our general body meeting. So that's going to be the 5.30, typical Friday, same time. 
um, you may nominate yourself or someone else by sending an <coughs> excuse me by sending an email to execs at hackucf.org. Um, in that email, please include your full name, the position you're applying for, and your UCF ID. That's the one without the letters. That's the one you student ID. I think the seven uh, number code and your current Discord handle. In addition to please including your knight's email. Uh, that's not there. Sorry about that, but um, we will also need that as well. And of course, if you have not already, please do join our Discord. Um, that's going to kind of be important if you do win the election, uh, being in the Discord for the club you help run, um, kind of goes together. The requirements for running for office, you must be an active student member of the club in this semester and the fall of 2020, which is last semester. Um, so what that means is if you are a freshman first semester, um, you are not eligible to run as an officer um, for the club. Um, an active student member, of course, means attending 50% of the meetings and paying dues. Um, to do that, um, as you may know by now, you can visit hackucf.org slash join. And attendance was tracked via the sign-in form. Uh, that's why we do this entire time. Also, Zoom sign-in history, if you use the night's email, can be supplemented for that. Um, that's an extra source for that. You must maintain a GPA of at least 2.5 and take six credit hours, fun, fun. If you're a graduate student, a graduate graduate student, um, 3.0 GPA and three hours, that's a part-time. So basically part-time, have a okay GPA, uh, and you must meet all these requirements when you are nominated and on election day. Um, all of that will be verified the day of. If you are not eligible for this, um, you will be notified in advance. So you will not um, be surprised the day of the election when you're suddenly not on the ballot. Um, anyone interested in applying, you are highly encouraged to please read the constitution and be familiar with it. Um, please don't take just the information here and kind of run with it. Um, that's available at hackucf.org slash constitution. There's much more information there, a lot of rules. Um, just be familiar with that. All right. Now I'm gonna pass it off to Kill for current events. Cool, uh, can you guys hear me okay? Indeed. Cool. All right, we'll go to the next slide. So uh, the first thing uh, we're gonna talk about real quick is Git.rip was seized by the FBI. Oh, let me get chat open, I see, just so I have it there. Um, if you guys know Tilly, uh, he was he's a pretty well-known hacker. Um, he did the Verkata thing. Uh, and if you're out of the loop, I put a little thing at the bottom. Um, so he, he was part of a group of hackers that got access to uh, 150,000 live security camera feeds, including like hospitals, prisons, schools, and like some even at Tesla. Um, does everyone know what git.rip is? I'm gonna keep an eye on chat. Yeah, free Tilly. Does everyone know what git.rip is? No? So like, uh, do you remember YouTube DL? There were, there were like a couple uh, GitHub repos that, yeah, pr pretty much. So uh, there are um, GitHub, uh, projects that get DMCA'd and taken down. And git.rip was basically uh, a place where people would like up DMCA'd repos uh, as like a backup. Uh, Tilly uh, was one of the uh, big people involved with the website. And they actually also um, had a lot of information on there uh, relating to leaks. Not only like just like, like Git repos, but they also had like full repos for like like they that they did the Nintendo Giga leak and they did other stuff like Apple, um, CD Projekt Red, um, Intel, AMD, and Disney. And I think the Intel one even had some credentials in it. Uh, and they were just upping it to this to this website. Uh, so there's a lot of really illegal stuff. So don't go to git.rip. Don't like don't try to go to the website. It's been seized by the FBI. You can still go to the IP address, but don't go to the IP address because it's likely being used as a honeypot right now. Uh, so stay far away from that uh, for, for now on. So, all right, next slide. So uh, Xcode Spy uh, was a vulnerability uh, that has been disclosed. Uh, to my knowledge, it's never been used to actually like attack anyone. But that fun little GIF that I have is, uh, uh, is an example of a Xcode project where the uh, you see the little tab, the clock on the tab is like animated with the options being chosen uh, above it. Uh, that 
like uh, that's just a free GitHub repo thing you could download. And what these hackers are able to do is they took like that like easy little thing that some new developer might download, and what they put in it is a script that would run when you build the project. And when you build a project, Xcode gives you permission, or Xcode has this feature called a run script, which basically like opens up a shell, and you can run any script you want in uh, the directory where the project is located. And these people found a, a vulnerability that, oh, it, Xcode doesn't actually check what you're running. So they were able to like get uh, like remote code execution going on. Um, so it's, it's pretty much a good game. I don't think anyone has been hacked by this, but it's a pretty bad exploit. So just if you're going to download open source projects just because it's open source doesn't mean it's safe. So um, all right, we'll go to the next slide. Just the last thing we're going to talk about, it's, it's a quick one. Uh, if you guys know Mimecast, Mimecast uh, they do uh, like Office 365 suite stuff management, and they got a they got some of its source code stolen um, by the same people that did SolarWinds. If you guys know the SolarWinds hack, um, uh, but there was no, They didn't get enough uh, code in order to be able to build anything or or put anyone at risk. So. So that's good. Um, but they did get source code leaked. So if you're writing code, make sure you're keeping it in a safe spot. All right. Thank you for the current events today. So now we're going to move on to the main talk, which is going to be on systems automation. So real quick, get things set up. All right, so there's going to be a few slides just to detailing a few things, and I'm going to in a demo. Um, I will have chat open. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to drop them in chat, and I'll try my best to answer them. So uh, first up, uh, basically, what is infrastructure as code, right? So if we're going to be automation, we're going to be writing some declarative files and all that to make things happen. So it helps to kind of get a little pretext for that. So the infrastructure as code is considered the process of defining and provisioning uh, that through declarative files. Um, rather than having to manually provision a bunch of machines uh, in a physical data center, uh, IAC, as it's abbreviated, allows for more powerful utilization of those servers. Um, touched on with other automation tool sets that we're not gonna be getting into today. Um, it's a bit more focused on specific ones. Um, you can automatically spin up and down virtual machines um, in AWS, Azure, any cloud environment and even local environments such as Hyper-V or VirtualBox or ESXi, um, that platform you may be more familiar with, uh, you may use it for school. I know we also get licenses for that with uh, being in the College of Engineering through that. Um, by using these definition files, um, a system administrator or a sysadmin uh, can very quickly deploy a multitude of environments as well as tear them down. So what that allows you to do basically is configure a common configuration across multiple machines and make changes to them in mass. Um, so if you have a few handful of machines, like in a home lab or a very small company, um, you may not see the massive benefit to doing automation. Um, but if you are a sysadmin for a very large company who manages tens or dozens or sometimes hundreds of servers, um, but they all kind of do the same thing, uh, then you definitely want to look into automating that because logging into each machine one at a time is going to be painful and you're going to not have a good time uh, most of this is going to be focused on Linux. Um, that's kind of the tools built for it. It does work on Windows, but we'll just be doing Linux today. Um, so in order to do all of this, um, we'll get right into it on what is Ansible, right? You may have heard the name. It's a wonderful tool. Um, but if you haven't heard of it, we'll take a little look at it today. So Ansible was developed by Red Hat as a configuration management tool that allows declarative configuration for you to configure operating system and application level settings. So what does that mean? Um, at the operating system level, you can change um, certain features. So you can install packages, remove packages, change your host name, uh, DNS records, upload and download files. Um, at the application level, Ansible has tons of modules. So with these modules, you can integrate with applications already on host. Uh, one of them is Docker. So if you have Docker running on host, you can then do automation tool sets with Docker, um, stuff like that. A uh, question in chat was, I thought the rule was if it took more than five minutes and you had to do it more than 10 times, then it deserves automation. 
Um, that sounds very specific. I'm honestly not familiar with that rule before, but if you're looking to build a system that is to be changed or expanded upon in at some point in the future, um, you may want to consider automating it because it's going to help yourself and anyone that follows you in that position in the future, as long as everything's well documented. Always remember to document what you do. Um, fun fact of like IT life. Um, if it's just a few machines, you, again, you may not want to automate, um, but it does depend on how long it takes and how much of a pain it is. Um, if you have time, it really comes down to you, right? If you don't want to do the same task 100 times, uh, you will want to automate it, uh, whether it takes five minutes or less, the more automation, the better, because then you can have it right on a schedule. And of course, uh, then it requires no interaction from you. That's just one less thing you have to worry about, things like updates, software patches. You can just automate that. So the way Ansible does this is it uses uh, what we call playbooks and inventory files uh, to hold the configuration for the target um, and the target to actually operate on. And we'll detail more of those in, in the next few slides. So the playbook is the file of tasks that's performed on the target host. The playbook contains tasks that say exactly what needs to be done step by step in that order and exactly as you say. The inventory file is a text file of IP addresses or host names that's used as targets. So that's where you put the IP address or host name of the machine you want to connect to and run these commands on of the playbook. So what is this inventory file? Um, that's used to specify the target host to run commands or playbooks. Um, hosts can be members of multiple groups as well. So you can make a generic group of let's say all Linux or all servers in a geographical location. Um, if you have, let's say, an Orlando office, you put all the machines there. If you have, let's say, a Texas office, you put all the machines there. And if you want different software stacks on each machine, you can then um, assign them to those group and then create playbooks that call those groups. Hopefully that made sense. Um, again, um, I don't know if I mentioned, but they can be a part of multiple groups. So a specific group for the location and then a specific group for the purpose. So you can have a database group or a web service group of all web servers who are also in the Orlando office. So they get that combination of settings. Um, so that's very useful there. And that's kind of a sample of how the uh, inventory file looks. It's very simple, it's not complicated at all. The web servers is a group followed by any additional lines of IP address or host names. Those get assigned to the group above it. So these playbooks, um, the hierarchy of those playbooks are written in such that the playbook is the entire file. And in that playbook, it contains plays. And then those plays contain tasks. Uh, the playbook can have multiple plays and each play can have multiple tasks. Um, and this will all be hopefully visualized soon. Um, these are written in YAML, uh, which is for like yet another markup language, uh, very creative. Um, they can set up play yep, plays contain tasks. Um, some tasks, again, you can install software, copy files, or just run straight up shell commands on host. So if there's no module for what you want to do, you can still automate it. You just have to run the commands kind of uh, ad hoc as you need them. So here's a configuration of a Ansible playbook. Um, this is a simple playbook that I've created that um, I actually use and installs WireGuard on a server. Um, additional tools I've created are optional, but you can see that up top, we have a name for the entire playbook. Oh, I'm sorry, for the task. So that task is configuration, I can't even see, for WireGuard instance. Um, the connection method is SSH. So that's going to be an SSH connection to these servers. Um, that's one of the great things about Ansible is it is completely agentless. On the machines you are controlling, you do not need to install anything on them to get these commands running. Um, if you can SSH into it, you can automate on it. Um, that includes Linux servers. Um, if you somehow get Windows SSH working, um, which is easy to do now, but that may also work. I've not tested it. Um, configure things like network appliances, like switches, routers, all that fun stuff can also be automated using the same method. Um, the hosts this playbook is applying to is all. Um, my deployment is very simple. So there is no groups. So I'm just saying all hosts in the file, which is like one of them, um, this applies to. And the tasks, uh, first task up top is going to be install packages as the name. And then the package list is going to be those lists there. Uh, NeoFetch, WireGuard, IP tables, speed test, stuff like that. Um, the state is going to basically declare how that's going to be there. Um, are these going to be present or are they going to be absent, essentially, right? If you build a new machine with a lot of dependencies in place, sometimes you don't want packages to be present. Sometimes you want them to be removed because of some dependency. So let's say you install a machine that requires Python version 3. Uh, you want to make sure Python version 2 is not there and Python 3 is. 
So you would create a package um, module that specifies Python 2 state absent, Python 3 state present. And then become and become method basically says run as administrator. And on Linux, they do that via sudo. Um, though sudo lets you run things as root, which lets you install those packages. Uh, the line in file um, lets you um, input um, or append strings to a file. So what this command does is it run, it attaches a new fetch to my bash RC file. Um, and if you're not familiar with bash RC, that is a uh, script that gets run every time you open a new bash shell. Um, so NeoFetch is kind of a um, informational tool that shows you information about the machine you're connecting to. Um, it's pretty cool and we can show that later. Um, the next thing is an authorized key module. Um, it actually takes GitHub usernames in, which is pretty cool, um, and URLs in general. So what that does is it specifies the user that I'm currently logging into, that's a variable name um, specified by the double curly braces. Um, and the state again is going to be present. Um, I want those keys on the machine. I don't want them removed. And the key file is actually going to pull from my GitHub um, where I keep my public keys for SSH. It's going to download all of the keys present there and then install them to the machine so I can access it from all of the other devices. Um, so this one controller machine that I have set up um, runs this entire playbook and then grants access to all my other machines automatically. Um, and then I copy a file, which is my WireGuard configuration. Um, and then I run the shell command to enable the WireGuard interfaces. Um, there is no module for WireGuard, so I can't exactly automate that in a nice pretty way. Um, it's going to be basically the, the ugly way. Um, if you can't automate it the nice way, just run straight up commands on host to get that done. So this is all used. Um, after you create a playbook with all valid YAML, um, it's very simple as running just Ansible playbook. Uh, tag I is the inventory file, and then you just run um, check and the playbook. What that does is it validates the, the configuration to make sure that it's working and you won't get any unexpected errors when you run it. Um, basically, you know, with typical, typical, um, typical YAML, uh, spaces instead of tabs, uh, it likes spaces. If you do tabs, it will uh, not be happy. If you write an entire playbook of like over 100 lines and you use tabs and Angela gets angry at you, um, you're going to have to convert all of those to spaces. Never did that one before. And then once you're ready to run that, you specify Ansible playbook and the inventory file, um, which is going to be the host lists. And then you just tell it what playbook to run. Um, the playbook is optional. You can specify a specific host on the command line, um, but you're probably better off running ad hoc commands, which is uh, one-off commands that I'll demo later. So in addition to Ansible, another feature of infrastructure as code, which is the kind of automation, but we'll still touch on it because it is useful to know, um, is Docker Compose. Um, so details here, again, basically more YAML. Um, Docker Compose, if you're familiar with Docker, get the container runtime, Docker Compose is kind of the um, orchestration platform on top of that that does a bit of automation for you as well. Um, you can create very similar YAML that is going to spin up containers and declare them in a state that you configure. Um, it's an extension to Docker and put a single configuration for multiple containers. Um, our store is actually using um, Docker Compose entirely. So we can easily spin it up and down and change settings um, and move between machines very easily. Um, yeah, it does provide a simple way to transfer the containers because everything's containerized and in a declarative file, you don't have to transfer a lot of data. You just have to transfer the actual YAML file. Um, on any machine you run that YAML file, it's going to spin up an environment in the near identical manner. So rather than backing up um, gigabytes of data or just a bunch of random files, you just need the one docker compose file that says how things are to be configured, and then you spin it up anyway. Um, and here's an example of a docker compose file. So left and right, these are actually the same file. It was just too long to fit on screen. So just visualize the right side being underneath um, the left image. Um, so what we see here is actually a docker compose file um, for our competition teams that I assist with. Um, this is our scoreboard configuration that has been deprecated because uh, it totally broke. But it wasn't Docker's fault, don't worry. So the services we see here, um, Nginx is a web server. So I'm specifying what image to use on Docker, um, what networks to use on that, ports and volumes. Um, and don't worry if you don't understand all of this. Um, I know it's probably a bit complicated. If you're not familiar with Docker, this is definitely a dump, uh, a jump for information. Um, please ask any questions if you um, want to know more about this. Um, but the Nginx is basically one container and Nagios is another container. Um, again, specific the image, the networks, environment variables, and any volumes for that. 
volumes are persistent storage that lasts across multiple containers and environment variables are just um, variable names that you pass through to the container to make it specific to your environment. Um, and as we declare things, we have to both instantiate them first. Um, so kind of like objects um, in OOP, um, any volumes you create must first be created on the right side. That is where I'm declaring those things. Um, so all the volumes and networks are being created and the left side is using those. Um, the nice thing about that is it's basically code. There is no editing configuration files where this is kind of a configuration file, but it's like the master configuration file. Um, like in the networks, we specify the private address to be a value of internal equals true. So anything using that is, is made as a private address. If at a later date, I want to change that, all you have to change is internal equals false, or just remove that line entirely and re up my container and everything's redone for me. It makes changes as per the config. So you can change things at a later date, which makes things very nice. So um, syntax for that is basically um, docker compose config, verifies your config, docker tech compose up, runs the configuration, and docker compose down destroys the configuration. Um, so it's very simple to spin up the entire stack and then tear it all down. Um, it's great for development, um, as you can containerize everything and go from there. So this is actually all known as immutable infrastructure. You spin up the infrastructure once and you don't touch it. Um, the benefit for that is because it's very consistent and it also makes things a lot more secure. Because um, you're not changing anything in the environment and it's going to stay the same, you know that if you have a good config and a good secure config, um, it's not going to break in the future. Um, if something does go wrong, you can basically blow it all away and rerun your commands, and it will be built up in the exact known good configuration. So if something does go wrong, um, you can rebuild very easily. You're no longer keeping backups of these massive data sets. You're just keeping the configuration of them and having them rebuilt from scratch. Um, that's kind of what Ansible is great for. Install all those packages um, in that exact way and copy the configuration files, and it gets rebuilt. Um, yeah. Any questions on all of this before we move into a demo? All right. Well, uh, we're just short meeting today. Um, sorry about that, but um, we now get our, our weekend back Friday nights. Uh, thank you everyone for showing up to the meeting. Um, if you are interested in running as an officer for one of them, please do email execs with the previous uh, meeting there. Um, that's kind of all we have happening this week. Check out the CTFs if you're interested. CPTC practice, I'm sorry, CPTC um, uh, submissions are being accepted. So please fill those out if you're interested in doing so. So until then, we will see you all next Friday. Um, have a good one.